the thanksgiving. But at the same time, pray also for us. That God may open to us a door for the word. And to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison. That I may make it clear, which is what I ought to speak. To walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And then in Ephesians 5, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. So, anybody see Dead Poet Society? Robin Williams? Well, in the movie, he plays the roles of a teacher at this pretty high-end prep school. <clears throat> in the first day of school, he takes the class of boys out in the hallway to look at all the pictures of the past, now dead graduates of the school. And he motivates them to learn and excel in life with the following words. He says, we are food for the worms, lads. Believe it or not, each and every one of us in this room one day will stop breathing turn cold, and die. Step forward and see these faces from the past. They were just like you are now. They believed they were destined for great things. Their eyes were full of hope. But you see, gentlemen, these boys are not fertilizing daffodils. If you listen real close, you will hear them whisper their legacy to you. <clears throat> Lean in. What do you hear? Then Robin says in this grave-like voice, Carpe diem, Latin for seize the day. Seize the day, boys. Make your lives extraordinary. So what brings that up? Well, I'll tell you the truth. If I had to do life all over again, I'd fish more. <laughs> you know, I've only been, what, twice last year, once this year, and it's my own fault. No, let's just forget it all. Let's all just go fishing. Because, you know, I'd rather be fishing. You can leave your troubles and thoughts behind when you're out there fishing. You know, my stepdad and brothers, they taught me how to fish. And they must not have been very good fishermen. And I remember as a kid going into Clyde's Dungeon down in Rushville to get my hair cut. There's a barber shop down in the basement. There's a sign on the wall that says the Lord created the world with six times more water than land. Therefore, anybody can see the good Lord intended man to fish more than to work. <laughs> you know, fishing for fish is good for the soul. But then again, I think if we just kept on doing nothing but fishing, our lives would be wasted. You know, I thought you said fishing was the answer to life. Forget it. All you said, forget everything I said. This is not the kind of fishing I'm talking about. I'm talking about going out and being fishers of men. This is a worthwhile pursuit. Jesus saw Peter and Andrew on the lake and he called out to them, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We need to fish more. We have a lot of decisions here. But oh how I would fish more. Because this is what the Lord created us to be, fishers of men. Seize the day while we can. You know, we need to pick up our pole. We need to have the courage and the faith to know that Jesus is the answer for many people's problems. And when then people begin to fight and buck, much like fish, the pole that we have is our confidence that we will get through this. We need to have a rod and reel. That will give us the ability to go and tell the message wherever it's possible. To cast that message out. Some people may only have a cane pole. Let them fish right in their own little water. But some of us got a Johnson cast a country mile reel. And we can fish clear on the other side of the pond. But the ability to fish all over helps. And we need to have a strong fishing line. You okay? Is he okay? Is John okay? So we need to have the fishing line, and this is the prayer and the word of God and the Bible. That is our fishing line. 
And without the thorough knowledge of the Bible and a strong prayer life, our line will just snap and break under the strain of the fish. And we need a hook. And the hook for people is the goodness of God and the forgiveness of sins. This hook is the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection from the dead for our sins so that we can be set free. This is the message of the cross and the empty tomb. But then again, we need a good church where we can keep the people that we call it. I mean, this is something as a church we need to keep working on. That is to get people involved in the church. Get people involved in the service. We need to be continually teaching, challenging them to go out and fish for themselves. And the bait that we use, that's our testimony. We show the goodness of God in our lives and what he has done for us. This is the bait. The fish are attracted to that bait because of the needs in their own lives. They kind of see how you are and they want that. You know, we've got to have that bait look really attractive. If our testimony and our witness is nothing but negative and coming from some complaining attitude, we're not going to attract any fish. You need to switch up your lure. And then we need a bobber, which is a sense of when people are ready to bite. We need to listen to others. We need to communicate the messages we know best. Then we need to pay attention to see if they're ready to make a decision. This takes common sense, and it also takes prayer on our part. A lot of fishing is just sitting, staring at the bobber, waiting for it to move a little bit. Operation Andrew came out of Tennessee. That is where you write seven names on a card and you pray for salvation for those seven people. I'd fish more. You know, in fishing for men, we also need to look around. We need to look up. We need to look out. We need to look forward. And we need to look after. First of all, by looking around, you know, God placed us where he wanted us. Where we live, work, go to school, we all know someone who needs Jesus. We need to view them as a pond where we can go fishing. We need to throw out some chum every once in a while. We need to keep our minds that the people around us need Jesus Christ. And many times we do not. And he died for all. All those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them. And he was raised again. So from now on, regard no one from a worldly point of view. And that's tough. That was Sunday school discussion this morning. To look at someone and realize Christ died for them too. When you just want to be confront them and be confrontational. The waitress, the waiter, clerk at the grocery store, the mechanic, the boss, those under us at work, the mailman, the UPS man, and those relatives that drive you crazy. God died, Jesus died for them. You know, a few years ago we went to Branson. I'm wearing my Big Daddy Weave shirt. She says, Jesus is the only name. And some lady walked up to me and said, I like your shirt. And I just nodded at her and she walked off. And to this day, I wonder what would happen if I would engage her in a conversation. It bothers me. You know, there are those who will get mad with us or we get mad with them and we take our eyes off the goal. So we all need to work to have a different attitude to change us and hopefully that will change them. We look around at people many times and say, well, they're not worthy of our time. What a waste of our time. Stop. 
Look around. Jesus died for all of them. Philippians 2.4 reminds us, says, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Too many times we become so much concerned about our own projects than we are about people. I know I'm guilty of that. It's where road rage comes from. I'm more important than those people in front of me. And that's sad. You know, those that we come into contact with every day, we need to make a deliberate attempt to fish them. Give them a few encouraging words, just a simple God bless you. Don't worry if they're Christians or not. Just tell them have a blessed day. You know, then look up. How do we look up? Through prayer. God answers prayers. Set aside time each day to pray for those that we come into contact with that we want to influence. You know, Samuel said to Saul, more, more forever as for me, far be it for me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Now, pray seven things for these people. God will kick the victim of their sin. Their eyes and their minds will be open for the truth. Pray for yourself as you witness to them. Pray for a natural opportunity. Pray that their hearts will be softened and pray for protection from the enemy. Should have no peace until they find Christ because God will draw them people to himself. Keep on praying at all times, no matter what reaction you get. We're to just show them love. First Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for hope that you have. Why do you believe what you believe? Sometimes they'll ask us when we least expect it and put you on the spot. Watch for ways to build friendships with these people. Earn their confidence. Do some things together. Maybe an invitation to dinner or some sporting <laughs> event, children's events, can build bridges to allow you to open up to talk about Christ. I know a guy once went and did laundry at a gas station and wound up with a wife. <laughs> you must spend some time and resources to build friendships and relationships. Luke 16 says, For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. So what does the world do for people who are willing to buy their products? Well, they wine and dine them. You know, we've got to walk in wisdom when we're dealing with people in the outside world. You know, Jesus gives a parable about giving a banquet for those who are unable to repay. You know, we need to do good to these people so they can hear the message. Build up a storehouse of love. <clears throat> Tom Landry, the Dallas Cowboy coach, used to teach Bible Sunday school every Sunday morning. Even after he was fired from the Cowboys, he continued to teach Bible study. He had a huge Bible study because people were too embarrassed to refuse to go to his Bible study because he was Tom Landry. But he used this fame to spread the word of God. We read about Cornelius, the soldier, invited all his friends and close relatives to come and hear Peter speak about the gospel. He fed them. He wined and dined them. So we need to stretch ourselves and make friendships with those who do not know Christ. And that takes two things, patience and tolerance. And most of us have the same problem, time. We are too busy. Do we have any unessential responsibilities in our lives that we have that we can eliminate to make room for people? We tend to place possessions above people in this country. Many times people will talk freely about their faith or the lack of it. In an informal setting. 
They won't talk about it in church, but if you're just out having a conversation, they will share about their faith or lack of it. You know, and we need to look forward. We need to think about events that we can do at the church, how we can invite people to these events. But in order to do that, we have to set definite dates. You know, Jesus talked in his parables how that man would have a banquet and invite guests, and the guests would not come. And when they didn't come, what did he do? He went and got some more people out of the pond and invited them instead. People will come if we invite them. That's the number one hidden secret about church growth. You want to grow the church? Invite somebody. Satan wants nothing more than to fill our hearts with fear and not ask anyone to come. He tells us that no one's interested in going to church. No one's going to take you seriously. Follow through is the most important thing. They will come if we make them feel comfortable, if we've been praying, if we've shown them love. Now plan on a date and get them in here. Seize the day. Make the most of our chances to tell others the good news. But be wise in all your contacts with them. Jesus went and ate with sinners, but he did not sin with them. And the last thing is you got to look after your catch. you got to take care of that catch. You don't want to get a ticket for wanton waste. Stay close to those who respond to Christ. The new ones, they need our encouragement more than ever. Satan wants nothing more to snatch them back away. The difference between catching men and catching fish. We catch fish that are alive and they die. We catch men that are dead and they are brought to life. And we need to nurture that life. We need to be their confidants. We need to be their encouragement. Just as a little baby needs consolation and strength. Scripture tells us all of us need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Pretty sure new believers have a lot of fear and trembling. We need to help them. They will have lots of questions. We need to be there to answer for them. And there is no shame in this answer. I don't know. Let's learn it together. Let's study it together. See if we can get an answer to your question that I can't answer. Those who do not come to Christ now, they may later on. So continue to love them and continue to pray for them. And don't get frustrated if nothing happens. Rome wasn't built in a day. Some people, it takes years to bring them to Christ. But you know, put out an attractive bait and one day they might just bite. Got to switch up that lure every once in a while. Sharp truth, zoom lizard, by the way, Steve. <laughs> it takes time. But many times it takes more than one person, more than one message, and more than just a few acts of love. We have to work on persevering for the sake of other souls. Not just to answer them, but to be able to answer them well. And our language must always be filled with the grace of salt. going to conclude with a parable. Now it came to pass that a group existed who called themselves fishermen. And lo, there were many fish in the waters all around them. In fact, the whole area was surrounded by streams and lakes, and they were filled with fish, and the fish were hungry. Week after week, month after month, and year after year, these who called themselves fishermen met in meetings, talked about the call of fish, the abundance of fish, and how they might go fishing. Year after year, they carefully defined what fishing means, defended fishing as an occupation, and declared that fishing is always to be a primary task of a fisherman. And continually, they searched for new and better methods of fishing, and for new and better definitions of fishing. These fishermen built a large, beautiful building called the fishing station. The plea was that everyone should be a fisherman, and every fisherman should fish. But one thing they didn't do, however, they never went fishing. After one meeting at the fishing station, the necessity of fishing, a young fellow left the meeting and he went fishing. The next day he reported that he caught two outstanding fish. He was honored for his excellent catch 
And then he was scheduled to visit all the big meetings at all the other fish stations to tell them how he did it. So he quit fishing in order to have time to tell other people about the experience of the fishermen. Imagine how hurt some more when one day a person suggested that those who don't catch fish really aren't fishermen. No matter how much they claim to be, but yet it did sound correct. Is a person a fisherman if year after year they never catch any fish? Is one following if he isn't fishing? Many times in the church we talk about fishing, about how many are really fishing. No one who's out there fishing, you're going to come home skunked. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. One day there's going to be no more fishing. There will be no bragging board about how many fish you caught. He catches them. Not us. And one day, there's going to be no more chance for you to take the bait. No chance for you to be hooked. Because right now, the mercy seat is occupied by Christ. Someday that seat will be empty. And there will be no more opportunity to come into his kingdom. And this is where you would make a decision to come to Christ, to give your life to him, and go fishing. I'm ready. You ready? <laughs> I go with Steve Gregory, but he always puts me in the part of the boat where I can't catch anything. I think that Steve uses a lot of Photoshop. <laughs> no. <laughs> but there are some good, good things about that. Yeah. So if you want to come forward, if you want to give your life to Christ. Or recommit. Or recommit. Today's a good day to do it. But if you'll please stand and uh, turn your hymnals to 332. Let's just sing the first verse unless we can get somebody to come forward. It's without him. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I surely fail. Without him I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Doesn't mean he won't talk to you. Okay. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, we've talked to him like three times already this morning. Okay. So, merciful, gracious God, we thank you for your love. And may we take to heart a lesson how we need to fish more. We walk by many lost people in our daily treks. Let us learn how to present to them your word. To be bold and powerful to realize that you died for all not just us and you died for those who don't know you while we were still sinners you laid down your life so we will praise and we will honor and we will glorify it and we will hold tight to the promise and we will pray these things in the name of Jesus who is the Christ Amen, Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures near below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. 
praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.